Holy okay. smokes! Is that his office? On Tuesday. Oh, I, I that is a huge office. That might be the most inaccurate thing I've seen yes. so far in this entire series. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Monroe and I am an ecologist. That means I study plants and animals and how they interact with their environment. I am also an academic, which means I work at a university as a teacher and as a researcher. I also happen to be a huge fan of the show The Good Place and one of my favorite characters on that show is Chidi, the tortured academic. I mean, what was your job? I was a professor of ethics and moral philosophy. So I thought as a fun way to talk about what it is really like to be an academic, I could review and break down some of my favorite scenes from The Good Place where we really get to see Chidi in his element working at a university. So let's get into it. So where are you from, Chidi? Well, I was born in Nigeria, raised in Senegal, but my work took me all over the place. Yeah, Australia, absolutely. Hong Kong, Paris. Yeah. What about you? Totally correct. This is absolutely accurate. Traveling is a huge part of the working lifestyle of an academic. We are regularly attending conferences or other big events where we get to meet with other academics. We share our work, we learn about what they're studying, we try and get together and come up with new big ideas and new projects. But one of the other major reasons that we are constantly traveling and moving to new places is because most university contracts for academics are very short. So we're constantly moving between new cities, states, or even new countries to get our next job. Honestly, for some people, this is a great part of the lifestyle. And when I was in my 20s, I loved getting to travel a lot for work. Now that I'm a little older, I'm in my 30s, I have a husband and a daughter, you do want a little more stability, you want to be able to plan for your future a little bit more, and always having to move for a new job and never having a really long contract can be a little bit stressful. Listen, Chidi, I've been studying your file. You're a very interesting case. You essentially only did one thing while you were on Earth. You thought and wrote about ethics. <laughs> yes, I, I spent 18 years oh, no. working on my manuscript right. called On we One Manuscript? 18 years? No, one. Practical ethics no wonder Michael's trying to get him to have some hobbies. World, right. Semicolon, a treatise yes, on the... That's, that's the one. <laughs> oh that's my god, the never-ending title. I think you title. should experience new adventures. Absolutely, he should get out there and do Earth. more. I love that they're showing an academic as someone who basically just lives and breathes their job and is a bit of a workaholic because I have to say, that's pretty accurate. Academics are usually very absorbed in their work. It consumes a lot of their time. And as I say, I would define a lot of us as workaholics. And even though some of us are not naturally workaholics, we still behave that way because academia is extremely, extremely competitive. And if you wanna get ahead, you've gotta put in the time. There was a study that was done several years ago in the United Kingdom that found that less than 1% of people who graduate with a PhD will ultimately become a professor at a university, which is astounding. So if you want to be a professor, you have to work really hard to be in that 1%. Thank you for trying to find me a new hobby, uh, but I just want to be an academic. Yeah. I want to keep working on my manuscript. Yeah. But he needs a hobby. Chidi, <laughs> here's the thing. See, I, I read your whole book, all 3,600 pages oh of my God, it. That's it's, long. um, how shall I put this? It's a mess, dude. Ah. Hey, she's right. See, Chidi, I can read the entirety of the world's literature in about an hour. This took me two weeks to get through. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's no. so convoluted. I just kept reading the same paragraph over and over again, trying to figure out what the heck you were saying. Oh, no. I, mean, I, I, have, I have both received and given feedback to people about their writing like this, so this feels very accurate. Writing skills are critical to being a successful academic. One of your main jobs as an academic is to publish research papers in academic journals. And the number of publications that you produce and the quality of those publications is what is used to judge whether or not you should be promoted or whether or not you should receive grant funding. So it's really, really important. Honestly, you probably imagine an ecologist like me spending most of my time outside, interacting with nature, but truly what we spend most of our time doing is sitting in front of a computer and writing. That's not particularly photogenic, so you won't see that on any of the scientist blogs on Instagram. During the writing process, you will usually send drafts of your manuscript to your colleagues who are also working on your research with you, and they will regularly give you feedback on what they think about both your research and the quality of your writing. And yeah, 
sometimes they can be a bit harsh. Academics, when they're giving feedback to their students or people they work with, they tend not to sugarcoat things. They tend to be very, very blunt, <laughs> to say the least. And I think it's just a time thing. They don't have time to be nice about it. They just want to give you the feedback and move on to the next thing. I remember being 23. I traveled from Canada to Australia to start my PhD and my career. St. John's it was so exciting. St. John's University, hey? Not a real university. At least not in Australia. Professor Chidi Anagonye, there he is. Holy smokes, is that his office? That is a huge office! That might be the most inaccurate thing I've seen yes. so far in this entire series. Video. So obviously this is a pretty small complaint, but I have never seen an academic with an office that large. That is huge. Even senior academics who have been at the university for decades don't have offices that nice or that big. There are really two types of buildings on a university campus. The old brick buildings where most of the offices don't have windows and they feel like dungeons, or the brand new all glass buildings that are open plan and nobody has their own office it's all just cubicles. Those are your choices. Some of the most senior and esteemed professors at the universities that I've worked for have offices that I swear were just like the size of a closet. Also, as a quick side note, there is no university in Australia called St. John's University. It's also a bit odd that they've said that the university was established in 1826, which is what it said on the wall, because the oldest university in Australia was established in 1850. So this fictional university is a lot older than the actual universities in Australia. This isn't really an error, I guess, just sort of a fun little fact. And I suppose they made up a fake university so that they wouldn't have to deal with using a real university's branding in their show. But yeah, still bugs me. However, the next thing we're gonna talk about is not so little. I'm about to point out a plot hole that has driven me nuts for years, and things are about to get real. So, in a nutshell, I have a 3,600 page thesis that I am nowhere near finishing. I am absolutely paralyzed by decision making, and it is destroying my life. Did you catch it? Did you catch the problem? Let's listen to it again. Well, I have a 3,600 page thesis. When someone at a university is writing a thesis, that means that they are a graduate student doing a master's or PhD. A PhD, or a doctor of philosophy, is the highest level of education that you can receive at a university. It is the highest academic level or degree that you can get. As part of getting this degree, you write a thesis, which is a large document describing your research project. Once you write your thesis, it typically gets reviewed by experts in your field, both inside and outside the university. And if it is deemed of a high quality and standard, then you are granted your degree. This is actually my thesis right here. Hey, eh? there it is. There it is. I've literally never opened this. You ready? Oh, did you hear it? Did you hear the spine crack? Never been opened. In case you're wondering, it is 167 pages. That's not bad. I ordered like six copies of this for all my family and none of them wanted it. So we just have six copies of this in our office. But here's the thing. Once you graduate from your PhD, no academic ever refers to any of the work they will ever do again in their lives as a thesis. That term, thesis, is specifically reserved for people who are getting their master's or PhD degrees. That's it. A professor would never be writing a thesis. And to be clear, this isn't just like one slip in the script. He refers to trying to write his thesis multiple times. I am 100 pages into my new thesis and it is some of the best writing that I have ever done. Well, I need to find a new topic for my thesis. Katie! Hey! Hey! I got a question. Is it, what's my thesis topic? Because I still don't know. If Chidi is writing a thesis, that would make him a student not a professor. So I'm not sure why he's saying he's writing a thesis. This plot hole drives me cuckoo bananas. I realize that thesis more generically can sort of mean idea, but that is not how that word is used in academic circles. It is used to refer to a degree, a master's degree or a PhD component. I don't really know why he's saying thesis. It doesn't make any sense. This is my thesis idea. I will explore the effect of near-death experiences on ethical decision-making. I will get a group of people together who have had near-death experiences, ask them ethical questions, and see if there's any commonalities. I like it. Right. 
Why are you yelling it at me? Because I need your help, you and your magic brain scan machine. Oh, of course, a joint study with the neuroscience department. Interdisciplinary well, work, MRI love it. To see if a near-death experience alters brain function. There's something there, right? This is actually yeah, accurate to this. what it is like also, to work as an academic. Night, just... Interdisciplinary studies are great, or as Simone was calling them, a joint study between two different departments. This is when people and academics who have totally different types of expertise come together to work on a single project. So in this case, a philosophical expert and a neurologist coming together to do a joint project. Awesome. Love it. I give them ethics problems and we scan their brains and we get a sense of their baseline moral instincts. Right. Then I'll show them pictures that trigger memories of their near-death experiences. We'll scan again and see if we get a different result. Sure. For example, Why not? I don't know anything about neurology, so, so maybe. But I do it's have so to say cool. that and this is a very fast God. turnaround time also, to go from I'm having an idea for a research project and actually die. getting it started. This is kind of unrealistic. Joe seems to imply it's been about a month since Chidi had his idea to their conducting the study, and that's really fast. So the normal process for wanting to conduct a study of any kind is first you have to have the money to do it, which requires you to apply for funding, usually from a government grant, but you can also get money from charities or other private funders. But the process to apply for that funding and then actually get it can take a really long time. Sometimes it can take up to a year or more. So just because you've had an idea doesn't mean you can run off and do it. You have to go get the money to do it first. But we could maybe give them the benefit of the doubt here and assume that they had some money lying around from a previous grant that they could just move over to do this study. Also, maybe it won't be that expensive of a study, so it doesn't cost a lot, they can do it on the cheap. Unfortunately, even if that was the case, this is still happening way too fast because if Chidi is a student and he is doing his PhD thesis, it is not that simple to just say what you're going to do for your thesis and then go and do it. There is a fairly lengthy approval process that you have to go through as a PhD student in order to conduct your study. That process involves doing a lot of background research on your topic, writing up a report which you submit to the university for approval, and then you have to give usually a large and long presentation to the university on what your project is. And then they grill you. They ask you tons of questions about whether or not your research topic is valid, whether or not your methods will actually work. It can be quite an intense experience. This whole process can take anywhere from six months up to a year. You can't just go from having an idea to doing the experiment. It has to get approved by the university first. In the chili pot and eat them both up. You put the peeps in the chili pot and add the m and You put the peeps in the chili pot and makes it taste bad. <clears throat> I'm gonna eat <laughs> Look this at the students. And the thing that I find amazing about their faces is those are the faces they make when I'm just giving a regular right lecture, whether I'm doing something weird or not. Just like this vacant face. So I'm sure some of you are watching this right now thinking that your college professors were just as bad, if not worse, than what Chidi is doing right now. And you know what? I feel for you. I too had some bad college professors who were not very good teachers. But if I could take this moment to speak in defense of your university professors, because there are a lot of factors that are out of their control that really hurt their ability to be good teachers and be the teachers they want to be. Universities, when they're evaluating professors or academics for promotion, they put a lot more emphasis on the quality of their research and the number of publications they produce, we talked about that, compared to the emphasis that they put on the teaching that they do and the quality of their teaching. Broadly speaking, to get promoted at a university, most academics need to be focused on producing lots of research publications. That is the single most important criteria that they will be judged on. If they don't produce a lot of publications, they won't get promoted. They won't get grant funding. There's actually a phrase in academia that we use to sum up this problem, which is publish or perish. So if you are an academic and you are struggling to get grant money and keep your job, where are you gonna put your energy? you're probably gonna put most of that energy into writing research publications and less time and energy into teaching. Universities also often don't give academics and lecturers sufficient time to write the lectures, 
teach the lectures and grade any reports or tests that get handed in. The Melbourne Uni Faculties of Arts and Fine Arts paid staff to mark one paper every three minutes. The union estimates workers here are owed at least six million dollars. The science faculty renamed tutorials practice classes, meaning they could pay staff just one third of the usual rate. And the engineering faculty claimed staff could do their marking in tutorials. It has already repaid $99,000 to staff. So the next time you have a lecturer or a professor at a university who doesn't seem like a very good teacher, please be kind because they are probably right at this very moment racing to get grant money or publish papers so they can keep their job. Well, after my Chile episode, I asked the administration for a one-year sabbatical and Just good out of news, the blue. they fired me. Really? So, I am free and easy. But he's immediately well, come back to his office. Off helping Jason. So there's actually a lot to talk about just in that little clip and much of it is very wrong. Let's start with this idea of a sabbatical because that word means something a little bit different at a university than it might at another job. Essentially, a sabbatical is a period of time that you take to focus on your research and the school relieves you of all of your administrative and teaching responsibilities. But what typically happens during that period is you travel to another university and spend some time working there. You learn from new colleagues that you don't get to spend a lot of time with. You develop new projects. You have time to be creative and think of new ideas. It's not a vacation that you can take to go do whatever you want. So yeah, if I was working at St. John's University and Chidi asked for a year off, probably not with a good explanation to have a sabbatical, and he wasn't planning to do any research, he was just gonna go save souls, I don't know what he told them, yeah, I probably wouldn't give him a sabbatical either. In terms of him being fired for the Peep Chili incident, I actually don't know that he would be fired. If you're a professor, particularly at an Australian university, that is the highest academic level you can achieve and it is extremely prestigious. It's very hard for universities to fire professors. It's not easy for them to do. It's a very long process. So I can't imagine he would just wake up the next day and be fired. But I understand the show just needs to move the plot along, but I still think it's not quite right. So, what do you think? I think it's 3,600 pages. I have a job. Pretty shoot. long. I have a family. Until I had to read this, I had a will to live. <laughs> this work is an insane tangled web of inscrutability in the fun grad students will analyze this for centuries way no in the unabomber way oh, okay love well, it um i'll love write it my so way much. out of the maze i'll re-outline the middle chapters very realistic to feedback no, i've gotten before on my you writing answer every question every philosopher has ever asked so what in these pages do you care about? This is about? a very All common problem for academics. Equally. We shut overwrite. Up. Shut up. We say shut up. too shut much. Up. We try and talk about everything up. in one document, and it's not a good the writing strategy. Work. As a PhD student or a junior academic within the first five to ten years of your career, it is very normal for you to have a senior academic who is supervising your work and guiding your research. That's very normal. And you would have regular meetings with that person where they would give you feedback on your progress and things you need to fix. But if Chidi is a full professor, meaning he is at the highest academic level at a university, he wouldn't be having this kind of thesis meeting. He wouldn't have an older, more senior supervisor telling him what to do and editing his work. He would be the person with students that he's supervising and helping them graduate from their PhDs. He would be so far beyond this, he wouldn't have a supervisor like this. He can either be writing a thesis as a student or he can be a professor, but he cannot be both. Having said that, there is one small exception to that rule, although I really don't think it is applicable here. In some disciplines, it is possible to be appointed to a higher academic level without having gotten a PhD. And the reason this sometimes happens is if somebody has been working for the government or working in private industry for many, many years, they may have the equivalent experience that you would get from doing a PhD. And so the university may just decide, you know what, you don't have to do the PhD. You have so much knowledge and experience from your work in the private sector or with government. We're just gonna appoint you as an academic. But I can't really imagine the industry or government experience that someone would need to get to qualify them to be appointed to being a professor in philosophy. I don't have a lot of experience in philosophy. I am an ecologist, so I could be wrong, 
but I just, I don't know what that experience would need to be to be appointed to that level. 99% of the time, if you are a professor, you've gotten a PhD to make that happen. I think this is just the show wanting to have its cake and eat it too. They want to have a Chidi that is an authority figure on the subject of moral philosophy, so they made him a professor, but they also wanted to have a plot line where he's struggling to come up with ideas and has thesis supervisors or just supervisors at the university telling him all the things that they're doing wrong. They wanted to have it both ways. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work like that. And so for someone like me watching the show, it's a massive plot hole and it drives me nuts. Shut up. All right, everybody, that is gonna be it for me this time. I hope you enjoyed my little breakdown of a few scenes from The Good Place about what it's really like to be an academic. As always, please do like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. And if you enjoyed this video, you can go ahead and click on this one right here where I talk about a really serious problem in academia, which is that very few women ultimately get promoted to the level of professor and why that's happening, and of course, what we can do to change it. If you like this video, I think you'll definitely like that one, and I'll see you next time.